By all means, please, help yourself. For as much as I love art house eccentricities and odd duck indies, they're not what I reach for when I feel the need to decompress. No, I find comfort in chaotic action, take solace in heady sci-fi nonsense, and feel at my most zen when zoning out with some low-brow, high-concept roughhousing. But you know who I always forget to invite to the party? Vin Diesel. The star of everyone's favourite pedal to the metal action franchise, by which I of course mean Triple X, not to mention the monosyllabic mascot of comic book adaptions. You know, like Bloodshot. As a fellow nerd and someone who could definitely beat up my dad, he deserves some degree of respect. Not just for being Mr. Clean in a muscle car, but as one of the architects of a truly ambitious, expansive series of science fiction epics. The Riddick Trilogy. What began as a taut, low-budget slow burn, before erupting into something approximating Lord of the Rings as dreamed up by H.R. Geiger's Warhammer Guild, is a truly rare cinematic prospect. An original intellectual property, driven by a unified collaboration between Diesel and director David Toohey, that defies incoming and outgoing trends. The results are a sweeping, overstuffed, often bad but occasionally brilliant document of one man's quest to convince the world he's really, really cool. Let me put it another way. Watching this trilogy feels like gazing into a bottomless barrel of Legos. At a glance, there's an untethered universe of possibilities and potential. And then you spot the Iron Giant here choking on a bunch of plastic bricks because he mistook them for candy. A transport ship crashes down on a scorched planet, leaving the passengers shaken and in search of rescue. Amongst the survivors is Riddick, a murderous convict blessed with night vision and a violent temperament. Both talents this ragtag bunch are going to need if they plan on surviving against a carnivorous alien species that stalks the dark. Revisiting Pitch Black 20 odd years after its modest release, I was taken aback by just how confidently it announces itself. Within seconds, bolides pierce hulls, shredding cryo chambers and turning bone to butter. All the while, our heroine attempts to kill every passenger on board in the name of self preservation, all soundtracked by the tinnitus shrieks of bending metal and unanswered alarms. As far as introductions for this sort of thing go, it's close to flawless. Not just as an inciting incident of breathless urgency, but for its hideous, unencumbered clarity. This kind of sour but simple storytelling carries over to the rest of Pitch Black. A film with an almost utilitarian commitment to doing a whole lot with very little. Just a cast of unknowns, a threat we rarely see, and an endless horizon of sand. Fans may recognise Rada Mitchell as the second build actor for every movie between 2000 and 2010, gravel voiced cult icon Keith David, and Vin Diesel, you know, from Knockaround Guys, but their work here is firmly in service of a representational ensemble. I mean, this is a pre-9-11 portrayal of Muslim characters as noble, wise and distinct individuals, that's a far cry from the monolithic boogeymen they'd become 18 months later. This coupled with the wide ethnic and cultural variety of the cast, lends the whole thing an organic sense of diversity, wordlessly alluding to a grand universe just out of view that isn't entirely made up of white dudes. As for the planet on which they crash, its Spartan desert is shot with the ragged grain of 35mm film and seared with a high exposure bleach bypass, making for an oppressive alternative to the industrial service ducts of most hide and seek sci fi horror. 
beyond the glare of the sun, there is always an insidious threat lurking in the shadows, one that's at its best when used as a peripheral menace. Opting for the Jaws rule of suspense that says, if you can't afford to show the monster, don't. And while the shuddering implications of giant skeletal graveyards are more effective than the so-so bloodletting in the film's latter half, there's a commendable lack of expository filler to explain away the alien's existence. Then, amongst all this, you have the towering presence of Richard B. Riddick, and it's easy to see why Diesel has such an affinity for his anti-heroic tank top aficionado. All you people are so scared of me. Most days I take that as a compliment. There's a gravitas to this performance that's begging to be realised in any of his other projects. Here he's genuinely menacing, enigmatic, and compelling. Three things he will never be described as ever again. Got it all wrong, holy man. I absolutely believe in God. And I absolutely hate the fucker. So for all the ways in which it succeeds, why is this so often viewed as a sterling effort rather than an outright genre classic? Well, the limitations that spark invention also result in plenty of shortcomings. Even though the central conceit relies entirely on the cover of darkness, night shoots are expensive, so more than half of the movie is made up of pace-killing, repetitious daytime scenes. There is god-awful green screen aplenty, visual effects that skirt by in the fog of battle but fall apart upon closer inspection. Then there is the issue of Jack. So, I guess something went wrong? A transmasculine figure who is outed and ostracised in the most humiliating, downright reprehensible gotcha moment imaginable. That's death row up there. Especially with the girl bleeding. What? The fuck are you talking about? She's not cut. Not her. Her. You gotta be kidding me. It's these stumbles, some budgetary, some boneheaded, that keep Pitch Black firmly in the realm of way better than you remember, but not quite as good as its cult reputation suggests. Which begs the question, how do you follow up a sleeper hit that costs less than a Prince Andrew out-of-court settlement to make? Apparently, with a $110 million high fantasy space opera, that falls somewhere between a LARPing weekend on Salvia and Flash Gordon's Fetish Dungeon. Riddick, on the run from the law following the events of Pitch Black, finds himself caught in the middle of an all-out war between humanity and the invading Necromongers, a not-quite-alive-or-dead militant race intent on indoctrinating or destroying the entire universe. From an opening that channels June by way of Conan the Barbarian, Chronicles of Riddick is a sight to behold, and a severe case of whiplash for anyone expecting another grit under the fingernails foray into sci-fi thriller territory. The blinding exposures and inky darks are swapped out for an ornate, tarnished bronze quality to the image, whilst the design of the whole thing has been overhauled and rebuilt into a meticulous work of gothic grandiosity. There's just a lot more to play with this time around. In fact, it's too much. I think I shit myself. Warring factions, political infighting, and a plot that's as labyrinthian as it is total gibberish, Chronicles is a film that thinks more plot is the same thing as better plot, somehow overstaying its welcome whilst at the same time feeling extremely rushed, like a muscular tortoise strapped to a rocket sled. 
Incidental details such as how Riddick gained his night vision are needlessly retconned for the sake of epic mythologizing. Jack from Pitch Black returns as a recast feisty femme for absolutely no good reason. And there's a whole library's worth of inscrutable lore, but not much meat or meaning to any of it. Maybe you should pretend like you're talking to someone educated in the penal system. While Chronicles never adds up to the sum of its parts, that's not to say some of those parts aren't good in their own right. And this is really the more important part. Dust my dick when you get the chance. From Tandyway Newton's Burnt On Eyeliner to a prison sequence that could and should have been an entire feature unto itself, the devil's in these neat little details. Let's play. And of course, once again, we've got Vin Diesel. You know, the guy from Find Me Guilty. Once more, Riddick heads off into the breach to make friends with alien wolves, murder someone with a teacup, and canonically confirm the existence of the human soul. And my god, is he not a lamb lunch of angsty fun. Of course, his strep throat growl doesn't leave much room for emoting, but it's the right tool for the job. A burly hammer to smash through the inscrutable script, and the languorous yawn of its more dull moments. You know, you're supposed to be some slick shit killer. Now look at you. For all its bumbling failures, damn is it refreshing to watch folks stepping up to the plate to take a swing and a miss on this scale. Imagine if Jupiter Ascending was watchable, or if The Phantom Menace didn't need all that post-Last Jedi contrarian denial to enjoy. That's the kind of two and a half star, occasionally boring but ultimately charming tosh this is. Fuck you. Despite a lacklustre box office and getting critically bummed in the gob, Mr. Diesel wasn't finished with old bright eyes yet. After some remarkably good video games, nine years, and one perfunctory cameo in exchange for the rights to the series, Diesel returned to the role with 2013's Riddick. Five years after claiming the Necromonger throne, Riddick is kicked to the curb and forced to endure alone on a hostile, barren planet. That is, until two competing mercenary crews arrive to finally put an end to the man who can seemingly punch anyone in the universe to death. <laughs> Having slashed the budget and scaled things back to the lean survivalism of Pitch Black, First impressions might suggest this is some kind of return to form. We open strong with a Riddick more beaten and bloodied than ever before. <coughs> Fighting tooth and claw against the brutal terrain and gnashing jaws of an unknown ecosystem. And there's an isolated ugliness that feels right at home with this character. Barring a gurgle of introductory exposition, he doesn't even utter a word for the first 14 minutes, pulling things back to a more primal, instinctive approach. But by the end of the first act, they drop most of this, and it's all downhill from there. You see, by responding to the criticisms levelled against Chronicle's lofty pretensions, Tui and Diesel have jettisoned just about everything that was interesting. Gone is the world building, any memorable set pieces out with a final siege, and most crucially, any kind of ambition. They say you lost your nerve, Arco. After that big swing and a miss. The contrasting cinematography of the first two instalments is traded out in favour of colour grading so garish and yellow it's fucking jaundiced. Watch your language. 
the acting is largely atrocious, and they completely waste the potential of a Batista Diesel showdown. Pitch Black had its wiry nastiness. Chronicles of Riddick got by on its decadent, ostentatious abandon. Riddick is the less interesting of both worlds, and without the level of engagement or distraction those entries offered, the flaws of this trilogy really start to show. By this point, our man has felled flying sharks, space piranhas, intergalactic ghosts, and waves of armoured assassins without breaking a sweat. That's when he's not walking off multiple doses of horse tranquilizer, ritualistically poisoning himself day after day, or shrugging off about a dozen bounty hunters, because apparently bounty hunter is the only profession in the Riddick universe. It's the Superman dilemma. How do you make an indestructible blank slate interesting for an audience? Well, you don't. Unless you count being a creepy, panty-sniffing weirdo as the towering ideal of excellence. Smell the woman. It's been a long time since I smelled beautiful. I haven't mentioned it up until now, but throughout the trilogy, the creative team opt to gussy up their star attraction with the kind of cringing quirks better suited to a sexual predator. I've been meaning to catch up with you alone. Unrestrained. Making sure to leave the most disgraceful moments for last, we're presented with the openly lesbian character of Dahl. I don't fuck guys. A figure whom Riddick takes a perverse interest in as he kills off her colleagues and repeatedly threatens her with sexual violence. Love those toenails, by the way. Matches your nipples. An arc that ends with Dahl getting so turned on by Riddick's masculine energy, she stops being gay so she can lay some pipe with this unshowered sociopath. I'm flattered. It takes things from anti-heroic to outright villainy, and it's a hell of a bum note to end the trilogy on. As a feature-length trilogy, Pitch Black, Chronicles of Riddick, and Riddick make for strange bedfellows. There's not much tonal or aesthetic consistency from one tale to the next, they're all varying degrees of indulgence, and operate almost entirely around the premise that Vin Diesel, you know, from Babylon AD, is cooler than everyone else. Yet, I'm still glad these films exist. For all their lead-footed foul-ups, they've got a spirited zeal and enthusiasm that's almost extinct within the major studio system, bending over backwards to expand the palette and possibilities of what could have otherwise been a niche little passion project featuring a character called Dick B. Riddick. So here's to this whole ego experiment. You're not great, and half the time you're kind of bad, but there sure as hell isn't anyone or anything quite like you. A tall, frosty corona for our Patreon producers Jennifer C, Claire M D, Becky O, J Carr, and Nicholas Le Revere, and a tacky crucifix for our family who support us over on Patreon. Oh my god, you have no idea how hard it was to do that video without mentioning The Fast and the Furious even once. So what's your opinion of the different films in the Riddick trilogy, and the series as a whole? Let us know down in the comments, and make sure you do all that like, share, subscribe, as it enormously helps the channel. If you're in a position to do so, consider checking out the link to our Patreon in the description below, where you can sign up to the Inframe Out Film Club, get your name in the credits, and access to our private Discord. As always, thank you for watching. Until next time, this is Inframe Out. Out.